One of the themes that Ajahn Mun would often talk about in his Dharma talks would be practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma. It means many things. One is that you don't try to change the Dharma to suit your preferences. Instead, you try to bring your preferences in line with the Dharma. Realizing that what the Buddha said was true, the big problem in life is the stress and suffering we cause for ourselves. That's caused by clinging and craving. And so that's the problem we have to focus on. If you start changing the Dharma in line with your preferences, you're actually giving more rein to the clinging and craving. And that kind of practice simply augments the problem. So you ask yourself, are you willing to put your preferences aside for right now and give yourself to the practice? The thoughts you like to think about, the other things that lie outside the path, you're going to put them down for the time being. You're going to focus right here. Fortunately, the work that is required by the path is not all unpleasant. There are times when it requires that you put up with some pain and you have to exercise some restraint over your, your clingings and cravings. There's going to be resistance. But what does the Dharma ask you to do? Noble things. Generosity, virtue. When you meditate, you develop a sense of well-being inside that doesn't harm anybody at all. And that's just the path. The goal is even more harmless, more noble. As in that phrase we chanted just now, admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. The path starts out well, continues well, and it's ending. It's something highly admirable. So try to develop a sense of conviction and confidence in what you're doing here. This really is good work in the sense that the work itself is pleasant. You're not asked to do anything demeaning. You're not asked to harm anybody else. And the where it goes is also very good. So try to breathe in a way that feels really good, really satisfying inside. You're going to be giving up a number of other pleasures as you practice, so the compensation is that you can develop a sense of well-being being right here. Breathing in, breathing out, getting very sensitive to the process of the breathing. And you're totally free to breathe any way you like. The Dharma doesn't say you have to breathe long or breathe short or whatever. Here's one area where your preferences can reign for the time being. What kind of breathing do you want to focus on now? What kind of breathing would you like to create for yourself to focus on? As you do this, you're learning an important lesson. There's a fair amount in the present moment that you can shape. So shape it in a good direction. Turn it into a path. Something that goes someplace. Because so many pleasures are not paths at all. You experience them and then they're gone. And that's it. Or even worse, as you're experiencing them, you're developing a lot of unskillful attitudes around them. Those attitudes are a path in the wrong direction. But here you're developing a, a pleasure, a sense of well-being that's harmless. And you're using it to make the mind clearer, to make the mind sharper, more firmly balanced, more firmly stable here in the present moment. That's good work. And if at first you don't succeed, then try, try again. In other words, if the mind slips off, just 
let go of whatever has pulled it away, and you're right back at the breath. Pay more attention to the breath this time. And also keep an eye out for the warning signs that the mind is about to slip away. This requires a quality called ardency, that you put the effort into it to do it well. Part of the ardency is motivated by the realization that if you don't train the mind, there's going to be trouble, both now and on into the future. But there are other ways of motivating your ardency as well. And one of them is having a sense of conviction that the people who found this path and have been carrying it on, transmitting it from generation to generation, are to be respected. You think about the Buddha. He really was serious about happiness. And when he'd found a true happiness, he was really serious about doing a good job of passing that skill on to other people. It's hard to find teachers like that. So many other people are pleased just to please other people. It's a lot easier. You tell people what they like, and they reward you. But the Buddha was not motivated in that way. He seriously wanted to do something that was really good for people, really would make a difference, help them put an end to their suffering. And you look at the example of all the really inspiring people who picked up that teaching and used it well. We have a debt of gratitude to them. And we can also take them as good examples, because they faced a lot of dangers, they faced a lot of pain. And they can be our inspiration as, you, as we go through the difficulties of the practice. As a passage where one of the Buddha's students is is out in the wilderness, and he's sick. He says, what am I going to do? Am I going to go back home? No, I'm going to stay right here, and I'm going to devote myself to the Dharma, using the mind to overcome the illness, and being inspired by all the people who have done this in the past. This is one of the reasons why it's good to read the, the biographies of the great teachers, beginning with the verses of the elder monks, the elder nuns and on up into the present. They give you an idea of what human beings can do. And then you practice. Based on that, this is what devotion is, is in, in Buddhism. It's not that we're trying to please somebody up there by groveling in front of them. We think about the Buddha's kind intentions and all the effort he went into in finding this path. And then over the centuries there's been, there have been times when the path has gotten overgrown with weeds and the people have come along and they've cleared away the weeds. It required a lot of work. You think about a John Munn and all the work he had to go through, all the difficulties he had in establishing for himself the fact that, yes, this path still works. I mean, most of the teachings coming out of Bangkok in those days were that the time for not only for nirvana, but also for jhana practice was over. Monks should lower their sights. And he got a lot of flack from other people for not practicing in the traditional Thai way. As he said, the traditions of Thai people and Laotian people and the traditions of every culture are the traditions of people with defilements. If you want a noble happiness, you follow the standards of the Noble Ones, the culture of the Noble Ones, learning contentment with outside things. And that can mean often learning to be content with the fact that other people don't respect you, they don't like your practice, and finding your delight not in things but in developing good qualities of mind, skillful qualities of mind, and abandoning unskillful ones, the sense that you've done something skillful in your thoughts, or your words, or your deeds. Learn to take delight in that. When you're tempted to do something really unskillful, but you're able to say no. Take delight in that, too. It's so easy when you feel temptation to 
to give in to those voices that say, well, you may be saying no right now, but you're going to say yes tomorrow, you're going to say next yes in five minutes, so why don't you say yes now and get it over with? You have to learn how to see through that trick. Say, so, in five minutes I'll make a decision in five minutes, but right now the decision is no. And each time you can say no like that, you're strengthening the mind, strengthening the mind. And learn to take delight in that. That way you find it easier to put up with whatever hardships are involved in the practice. I was just saying this afternoon, the Buddha points out that you don't want to deny yourself any pleasures that are in line with the Dharma. But if you find that indulging in external pleasures is creating unskillful habits, or even just kind of hanging around in the pleasures of concentration when you should be ready to move on. If you see that happening, you've got to exert extra effort. So learn how to delight in that. Don't make it the kind of extra effort where you're just gritting your teeth. Find some way to psych yourself up for this. And one of the ways, of course, is thinking about the fact that the Buddha really was an admirable human being, and there are so few in this world. You should treasure those that are. That passage we chanted just now, the Buddha is immeasurable. The qualities of mind that he developed. The goal at the end of the path that he was able to attain. There is no measure for that. So we're dealing with something that's bigger than an ordinary human being. The Dharma is also immeasurable. The Sangha is immeasurable. They're qualities. And bigger than anything else you can think of in this life. So they're not only bigger than creeping things outside, but they're bigger than creeping things inside, the creeping defilements and the creeping unskillful qualities that keep eating away at your, <coughs> at your potential for true happiness. So as you're trying to stay here with a breath, use these thoughts as motivation for doing it well, giving it more of yourself than you might ordinarily do. Because this is something that really is worth giving yourself to. Because it more than rewards the efforts. <laughs>